Hey, everybody, this is Mark Levine, and you're listening to the NYC Real Estate Podcast. This is episode number 26. This is actually our second episode since COVID-19 has really upended our lives, and we're working from home, and we're doing this on Zoom. So today, I wanted to bring back Justin Weiser. Hey, Justin. Hey, how you doing? Good. So you're with William A. Slutsky, PC. Um, You're an attorney, and... You were pre- you're one of the first return guests onto the show. So you were on episode number eight. And on that, we covered contracts on major projects. So uh, after you listen to this podcast and you want to hear more, uh, when I had Justin actually in the studio in person, head back to episode number eight and you can and check that out. So before I get started, let me just tell everybody that. Um, so I'm Mark Levine. As I said, I'm the host. I'm from management company EBMG. If you want to email the show, you could do so at nycrealestatepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's nycrealestatepodcast at gmail.com. If you want to call me directly, feel free, 212-335-2723, extension 201. And Justin, before we get started, I'll give out your email address and phone number, and then I'll give it at the, at the back end of the podcast as well. It's justin at wslawny.com. That's justin at wslawny.com. And your phone number is 718-263-9292. Okay, I got that out of the way. So what's going on? How are you dealing in these COVID times? Oh, I'm I'm just peachy. Um, I was was waiting for the music. You had great music. I used to have music, but now since we're doing it on Zoom, I may either I put it separate and we don't hear it or I just go into the podcast without it. But once I, I have my recording software and hardware back in my studio, that's, that's an easy play because that's like a quick button that I, I used to hit. Okay. I know. We've, we've had to make some adjustments, you know? Yeah. These Working are challenging out. times. <laughs> These are challenging times. When I'm not fighting off the kids, I'm fighting off the music. So fine. If you hear it, the, the only music you'll hear in my background will be my two-year-old daughter. Yeah, um, that's so, fine. That's welcome. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so why don't you give a background for those people that haven't listened yet to episode number eight uh, on your experience in this real estate world that we're in uh, and what you specialize in. Sure. So uh, my name is Justin Weiser. I am a partner at the law firm of William A. Slutsky PC. So I guess that one of the changes, there have been a couple of changes since we last spoke about a year ago or so. Uh, one is that I'm now a partner. Two is that I've grown a mustache. <laughs> I noticed. Yeah, so I figured I, I can't. I can't dye my hair purple, so I might as well experiment yeah. with facial hair. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a partner at the law firm William A. Slutsky PC. We are a, be- a boutique law firm based in Forest Hills, Queens. We have an office in Manhattan. And uh, we are a real estate law firm with the specialty in representing condominiums and cooperatives. We represent buildings as general counsel all across the city of New York uh, and in Long Island and surrounding areas. And so basically what we do is we advise boards on issues that come up in buildings that can be everything related to construction contracts and service contracts, interpreting underlying documents, dealing with shareholder disputes some landlord tenant issues and things like that. Uh, We also do a high volume of transactions, both for the cooperatives that we represent and then also individually. And so that involves people purchasing residential apartments, condominiums, cooperatives, single-family homes, multifamily homes, multifamily apartment buildings, and other mixed-use properties. We deal with leasing matters on both the landlord and tenant side. Um, and it's everything re- related related to real estate. And one of the things for us, because we do a, a very high volume of, of transactions, uh, at this point, We've been through so many scenarios, both in representing buildings, but also representing individual buyers and sellers to understand how you move through the process of dealing with closings in a time where people can't meet and um, how you get around the logistical hurdles, headaches, circus, whatever you want to call it. Well, that's actually something that I wanted to talk to you about today was, you know, logistically with uh, closings, whether they're by escrow or they're postponed. We do a lot of closings in our office. My office right now is closed to the outside public and we have very skeleton staff that like shifted time so that we have not everybody in at once. And 
we are considered to be an essential service, you know, so our office is still quote unquote open and where we can, we have people working from home. Um, as I said, we have shifts and we're starting to slowly like reopen the, you know, the, the office, the way that we're, we're set up right now is helpful with that. It was great for social distancing already. I mean, most people have their own offices. There's no interior bullpen where everybody shares. Um, we ordered all those dividers, like the plexiglass dividers, so that for the people that do share an office, like there's a divider up, and now we've got you know, sanitizing liquid for everybody when they come back. So, um, and everybody's going to wear masks. But we are still, as I said, close to the outside office. So, in terms of the closings that we do, they've mostly been um, done in escrow or we're postponing them. So, why don't you? If you can walk us through from your legal perspective, like what are best practices right now for closings that, you know, I, ha I let's say today is April 30th, I have to close by May 4th, right? So what is the, um, what are the options available to me as a buyer or a seller to kind of close the deal and, and get that done while operating in this while we can't meet in person world? So first of all, I actually just closed the deal representing a buyer in one of your buildings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, dealing with your office was one of the more flexible ones. Okay, great. Everything worked out. Everything worked out well. So the first question is, from if we're talking about April 30th and closing May 4th, that still may be a tight timeline. Right. And so- I was just giving an example of, you know, pick a date, we have to get it done. Right, right. So the first issue is always going to be if there's financing. And so even be before that, all of this depends on who, who do you have at, on your deal? You, you know, who's the seller's attorney, the buyer's attorney, who are the individual clients? Because sometimes you have clients who don't have technological capabilities of wiring money or even printing and signing. Uh, sometimes you have clients who are actually sick and, and they really can't do anything. And, and so those are hurdles that you may not an, an anticipate. So every deal, the first thing is every deal is different. Mm -hmm. And every deal is different because it depends on who you have. So the individual clients, the buyer and seller's attorney, the bank's attorney. And if we're talking, let's just limit it for this purpose to the, to the co-op, presuming it's a co-op. If it was a condo or a house, you have a title company involved, and the title companies are also dealing with it differently. And some are in bank attorneys and title companies are charging additional fees, which they should. And I would say that most buyers and sellers' attorneys are, are charging some type of feedback to their client because what's ordinarily taking a, a much shorter time on a traditional, regular sit down closing is now taking easily 10 times as long. Right. I just looked back at an, e at an email chain on Monday where someone had delivered a, uh, checks and documents and they sent it by priority instead of by, by overnight mail. There were 170 emails just on that one item. Wow. So imagine if you're doing any type of volume, dealing with that, on every single deal, plus the calls, yeah. plus um, your your office, everyone is is working remotely. So the process of getting documents, even within your own law firm, for example, if you're signing with the power of attorney, someone else has to be notarizing that they're visually they're they're doing a, a Zoom conference like we're doing now, uh, but then I have to go pick up that notarized page from my paralegal who lives in another part of Long Island. So usually it's just, it's done. Someone comes in, boom, boom, boom. But now because everyone is working remotely, you then have to deal with the extra step of FedEx or, or driving by car. Yeah. And also uh, on the co-op side, especially with recognition agreements, with stock certificates being signed, with proprietary leases being signed, we've run into situations where it may be a little tougher to get maybe the president and the vice president or the president and the secretary to sign. Some buildings have through a corporate resolution appointed the attorney or ourselves, whoever's doing the closing on behalf of the co-op as the transfer agent for that particular 
um, instance to become an assistant secretary to have the authority to sign. And that's, you know, through a board resolution, through the minutes, it's all, you know, corporately structured in a way that it could be traced and properly done. But that's something that you never really think about in a normal closing because you can just, you know, drop off the documents to the board and say, please sign this. I'll pick this up in three days, you know, when you have a chance to look at it and there's no rush. But now everything's a rush because we're putting all these pieces of puzzle together that really there was no puzzle before. It was just standard. Oh, absolutely. And I, I know you, I just kind of went off on a tangent, but all of these, we're, we're going off on tangents because every one of these de deals has their own, own tangent to it. And there's a hiccup that's different on every single transaction. And I can give you a couple of the, you know, short examples, uh, but to get back to the process. So in it, you're, you're cleared by your bank. You want to close in, let's just say, say two weeks and the co-op is ready. The, the co-op um, has to get documents signed in advance. So, so to your point just before, the co-op has to make arrangements, logistical arrangements on their side to have uh, stocks and leases signed by, a, um, by someone authorized to the board, typically a board president. And so if people who are coming into an office in Manhattan are now working in Long Island or Queens or whatever, they then have to get packages to their house, someone has, uh, at most of the law firms, they, they have either sent someone into their office or they've taken things home with them. And then they're then uh, personally driving to a co-op's, uh, 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 to a co-op apartment, meeting someone and they sign, you know, in, uh, in, in the lobby, they then run out, they drop it through in, into a car window and someone leaves. It's like an it, it's like a narco's episode, which is maybe one of the reasons that I decided to grow the mustache. <laughs> so there there's that challenge. Then on the buyer and seller side, most buyers and most sellers are closing with powers of attorney. So uh, a power of attorney is always a, it's a dangerous document. Um, these are limited powers of attorney that will give an attorney or someone else the ability to sign on behalf of their client as if they were them just with respect to this transaction. Now, because uh, most people can't get access to a notary, you know, they can't walk into their bank now and just have someone notarize it, or they can't go to their company because their company's closed. The state of New York has authorized um, uh, a remote notarization uh, a, a, a remote notarization authorization, which basically allows uh, a, allows notary publics to uh, witness someone's signature um, as if they're notarizing them through a Zoom conference. But there are parameters set with that. Uh, the, the 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 recording or the video has to be recorded. Um, the person who's signing then has to email or scan or fax. Uh, their signature pages on that same day, and then they have to be sent afterwards. And you'll then need the original uh, to then give to a bank and to the co-op. So that process has come with logistical challenges. Then imagine you've got a client who is technologically not able to do that. So then how do you work around that? Can you meet him somewhere or have him come to your office? You sit apart, he signs, uh, he leaves and you're keeping, you're keeping distance. Everyone's wearing gloves and masks. Um, presuming you can, get, you can get that done, the next question is in the in regular closing, buyers and sellers are working out uh, adjustments and numbers between them. And then the bank has to subtract their closing costs and deliver final proceeds or a net, a net proceeds number to a buyer's attorney. And then you have to coordinate, how is the bank going to deliver the money? How is the purchaser going to deliver the money? How are documents going to be delivered to the co-op? How is the co-op going to deliver documents to the bank? And how, how is the seller going to get certain documents to the bank and the co-op? So you can see, like, we just, I just went through, you know, six or seven different, yeah. different handoffs. Okay, imagine it's basically like a football game but it's a crazy play where people are reversing and then you're flipping it back and then you're lateraling. And that's the challenge in all this. So when you have people who've never done that before, 
it becomes really challenging. And when I say you haven't done that before, meaning, meaning attorneys, meaning clients, meaning, meaning co-ops. In a former life, I used to represent uh, developers and, and, and owners of big multifamily properties. So you'd have a, a, a buyer in New York, a bank in Texas, and a property in Tennessee. And it's a $50 million property, and that transaction is closing in escrow. Everyone's sitting around the computer. There are long instruction letters with how you release money, how documents get, get delivered. Uh, people are sending wires, and people are charging a lot more. And it's an understanding that the process takes longer. With co-ops, very different story. Uh, and one thing that people don't talk about is that most attorneys on a residential uh, co-op transaction, they're not getting paid those kind of, kinds of sums. And then you're dealing with the, with the issue of a stock and lease being signed, which makes closing an escrow so much more, so much more difficult. Okay. Add into that banks, um, banks are most banks. I would say just about every bank that I've dealt with are in order for them to fund money, they are requiring possession of the stock and lease on the quote unquote closing date. Now, technically you can't close until all parties sign off that you are closed. And so there you can see where people run, in, run into problems or where you can run into problems because um, if, a, if a bank has, this, has the stock and lease, but the co-op didn't collect the flip tax check or the seller didn't get the money, um, you can't necessarily say that you're closed. So when errors happen, it's never just one thing. There's always, it's this, then this, then this, and now you have a problem. So the danger in a lot of this is when you have parties who haven't either, who haven't worked be together before, or there aren't clear instructions and everyone's just kind of going willy nilly and then everyone's super busy on top of things, it creates the potential for errors to take place. And so what are the things that you want to look out for or be careful about? Well, you want to make sure that everyone is on the same page for how you're delivering documents, who's receiving what, and who's getting certain things in advance. And you want to give yourself a cushion to make sure that parties have a little bit room for error in case things don't arrive on time. And the first thing, most importantly, is really to check with the bank to make sure that you understand their process. Because if you, the bank isn't okay, then no one's, no one's getting any money. Sellers have to be careful to make sure that they're not, they're not authorizing I would say actually, let me rephrase this. Buyers want to be, be and I would say actually all parties and the call of two want to be careful that you, that a, a closing isn't officially closed um, until the seller gets their money and the co-op gets their money. Um, and inevitably, in order for a co-op transaction to be finished, a new stock has to be issued to the buyer and the old stock has to be canceled by the co-op so that it's clear that there's that this per, the, the buyer is the new owner and the bank has got an interest in the buyer's apartment. Well, when you're closing in, you know, quote unquote, in escrow, you, you may be closing on a Monday, but people are not getting documents in a perfect world Tuesday, but oftentimes Wednesday or later, depending upon when people are at their desks and actually yeah. can get things. So parties just need to be careful to make sure that, that, um, uh, that, that they're not releasing until they've, they've gotten their money. A lot of steps. Because oh, I know yeah. I, I've sat through countless closings over the last 20 years as the transfer agent. And, you know, when I was, from when I started learning this business until even now, I still do closings. But there are things that come up at a closing when everybody's sitting at the table that will disrupt the closing and it could take hours to fix when everybody's there together and, Oh, I have to run to the bank. I have th this paperwork is wrong. Uh, you know, this filing is wrong and those papers are then shuffled across the table. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So when we're putting in another layer of confusion and I could, I could probably 
see that there would be a lot of closings that would be disrupted totally by this process where it's not even it's it's not a today it's not even maybe tomorrow but we have to reconvene this virtual closing on another day completely because something has to be worked out that's not so easy as let me run down the street to the bank and you know get the bank check uh, i'll give you uh, i'll give you actually i had a closing yesterday the closing was supposed to take place last wednesday my client worked for the worked for cuny works for cuny and so CUNY has furloughed all of their employees uh, or, or, or a, lot, a big portion of their staff. So when the bank went to go check his employment, they couldn't get a hold of anybody. Wow. So we were supposed to close. They couldn't check his employment. And so, they had, and so he called me at the 59th minute and said, look, you've got to get your supervisor on the line. He said, well, my supervisor is not HR. I said, I said your supervisor is HR for now. I said, because you need to start getting your ducks in a row to make sure that you call her who calls this person, who calls the next person to help you out. You need to, almost like in a game of Survivor, you need to get your allies on board for you. And so he did that, and then we had to, we adjourn the closing. And so the seller who was a sponsor had sent all the documents in advance to, to, to the bank attorney. Uh, so we adjourned, we actually closed yesterday. I walk in. And they have a separate room for doing the closings. The interesting thing was it was a converted garage. And um, I, it looked like you were, you didn't know, I didn't know where I was going. And so they just said, there's a garage in the back. And I thought I was going to some fraternity for some weird pledge type of uh, <laughs> uh, episode. And you walk in um, and I walked in and someone came in. We sat on opposite sides of the tables with masks. I said, okay, well, I need to see, I need to see the checks brought from the, from the seller. And then there was a pause. The bank, the bank attorney had lost the package with all the checks. Wow. And, and so I, and so they came in, people were, were upset. I said, guys, calm down. I have no doubt that you have this package. Um, my guess is you probably misplaced it in another file because you've been super busy or whatever. And an hour later they found everything and we closed, but you can see like, those are just, just, just two hiccups. If they were not able to locate the package, then either we weren't going to close or we would have had to come up with another scenario where then the seller recut checks, they circulated copies of the checks, we're not closing until they hand deliver them. And there's ways around these things. But to your point, there's always something that comes up. Um, and you have all these little, and each deal has got its own set of hiccups. Yeah, and uh, it's unique. I mean, we're approaching May. Uh, we'll see how long the social distancing lasts. This could be all summer. I mean, it also could be once everything opens up that not everybody feels comfortable going into a room together, even if they said, okay, you can be in a room together. It's just like flying. Even though they say that you can fly, do you want to fly? You know, yeah. that's the, the risk reward of being in business and having to go out in the world and, you know, subject yourself to possible issues. So you know, if people, especially if people at home are sharing a home with somebody that has a health condition that may make them more susceptible, they may say, you know what, you're, even though we're allowed to close, you know, in person, it might just make sense that we do this all by uh, escrow and stay in our offices, get the uh, FedEx, the UPS, fill everything out and get all the checks that way. So I'm interested to see, you know, as we do this more often, if it's going to be something that becomes more ordinary. Uh-oh, I should have said shut off all phones. Well, you know what? I don't, the interesting thing is with working at home is that yeah. I have my phone on silent, but I have no idea because I'm now working on a Mac and I'm not oh, a Mac yeah. guy. Oh, yeah, it shifts over. It comes through through my computer. Yeah, you're, you're all tied in. I got my phone on uh, airplane mode, but I realized that I'm on Wi-Fi calling because I don't get really, really great reception at all in my apartment. So I'm still getting all these phone calls while we're on here, but at least I'm not working on a Mac right now. So I don't have that problem. I negotiated a lease with the landlord two, two weeks ago and we finalized everything. Three days later, I was doing work. I was on a call responding, responding to an email um, and then my wife sent me a text with my daughter uh, in the car. It was a lovely photo. I texted back, love you guys. And instead of texting my wife, I texted the landlord. 
<laughs> the landlord wrote back to me, I think this is the wrong thread, but love you too. Uh, and, I, and then I, I looked down and I said, oh my gosh. And I was just lucky that it wasn't anything that was yeah. really bad. And we all had a laugh about it. Yeah. But that, that sums up, I mean, everyone's working from home. Everyone, uh, yeah. people, have, you know, people have kids at home. <clears throat> You're under different technological circumstances. And it's, it's very easy to see how errors happen. That's a funny story. But I'm yeah. sure there's, there's definitely other ones. Oh, yeah. So, so we we kind of touched upon, you know, the escrow closings and just the process of getting everything signed, getting everything over to the attorneys, making sure that everybody gets funding. Uh, what if I'm in a deal that all of a sudden, you know, we, we touched upon it just before we, we started recording, but what if I'm in a deal where I've, I've lost my job since I went into contract, uh, I can't get to, you know, maybe this isn't the best thing for my life anymore. Maybe I need to rent a studio instead of buying a three bedroom because my funds just evaporated. My income evaporated. I can't take on the debt service that's going to come with a three bedroom apartment. What are my options if I'm in contract and I'm, I'm at that place where either I've been board approved or let's say it's a condo, maybe you just had a right of first refusal was fine. Uh, co-op board approved. Is there a way for me to get out of this deal so that my financial health in the future won't suffer irreparably? It's, it's a great question. And the answer I'm going to give you that is every lawyer's favorite answer is it depends. It depends on, on, on where you're at. And I'm talking about both on the, on the commercial side and the, and the residential side. So <clears throat> A lot of um, buyers, <clears throat> as, a, as a remnant of the 2008 financial crisis, most buyers' attorneys started. Hi. Hi. <laughs> is that a little person? Yes. Uh, we can interrupt and say hi. Hold, hold on one, one second for me. We'll just, if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah, I'm just going to give me one second. Uh, well, one. she was very cute. We had somebody that interrupted, but adorable. So while uh, Justin is tending to his parenting duties, which we all have that happen, you can uh, email the show at nycrealestatepodcast at gmail.com. Again, nycrealestatepodcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, I would love for you to subscribe. Try to put out episodes as quickly as possible. Uh, right now, as you said, we're on episode 26. So we've got a lot of great information. And Justin, you're back. You, Sorry about that. I think kid. Uh, it's a chat. My, my wife is working from home and she probably got ended up had, she had a call and then forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute though. So, so i um, the, the, so, so getting back in 2008 after the financial crisis or when the financial crisis hit, um, you had very tumultuous circumstances. You had banks who were going out of business, which was the real problem at the time. So, um, and lend all the lending requirements, for, for mortgage banks changed. So bank, it, people who were in contract were very concerned or basically happened where the bank, you started 90 days or 60 days before. And then at the end of that time period, the bank wasn't operating anymore. And so, so attorneys started putting funding contingencies in their, in their contract. The, standard cooperative contract or even house contract or, or condo contract um, where someone's getting financing says that the contract is contingent upon the buyer getting financing in a certain amount. Now, um, that, that contingency relates to, it is contingent on your delivery of a loan commitment letter by a certain time. The question becomes what happens in between the delivery of that commitment letter and closing if something happens, okay? And so, so if you have a funding contingency, it then depends on what's the nature of that funding contingency. Does it allow for things like, like job loss? Uh, there will be attorneys who will carve that out uh, on the seller side. Um, the best thing that you want is to say something that's not related to the fault of the purchaser. Um, and then, and then you say if someone loses their job, it's not their fault that they lost their job. The company laid them off. And so people will start to negotiate that and willow it down 
Um, a, a lot of times sellers attorneys want to have provisions that say that it's only related to the co-op um, and they don't want to take that risk, especially if a seller is selling an apartment or a house and then they're buying something else. They don't want to take that extra risk of a funding contingency um, on higher price purchases, especially you get to Manhattan, $2 million, $3 million. Uh, a lot of times people aren't giving funding contingencies. Now, all that, it's fluid right this this process is happening right now and you'll you'll you're seeing deals or the deals that are happening most people are not closing without some sort of funding contingency it's it's too risky and then those funding contingencies are now being adapted for covid right they're being adapted to say uh, um, for periods of time relating to covid that we don't have to the buyer doesn't have to pay those fees or you're extending um or you're getting a right to get your money to get your money back. So the question is, is most deals right now were, were done before COVID hit. So then the next question says, well, what do you have in your contract? And then the question also becomes, well, when did the event happen? Um, when did the, so when did the person lose their job? When did things change? Because depending upon the timing of the event, it may give you a little bit more flexibility say um to be able to get a rejection letter from the bank and then it's it's much more clear um than if you're later on uh remember a lot of people have made plans for themselves to move and and to leave and so all of a sudden or buy something else in the worst case situation and then you can have a real bad domino effect and and you know depending upon who who else you also have meaning the buyers and sellers attorneys do they know each other? Have they worked on things in the past? Uh, for the most part on residential transactions, people don't want to keep people's money. They want to be able to close. Now, the, where do you get into exceptions? You get into to that general exception to that sponsor deals. They just don't care. It's because it's they're looking at it like I've got a construction loan of $75 million and I have to pay this off. I don't care what you have. And then you've got to be really careful as an attorney. You've got to be careful to know what your contingency is. Um, I, I literally just had a client who had a, a huge change in job circumstances. Uh, and before even going, when she, she went, she, before she went to the bank, she said, my, my, you know, they reduced my hours by like 80%. My salary's gone down by 80%. I said, just don't even get a don't even get a commitment letter. Go right right for the rejection, because what people don't tell you is that bank will easily give you a commitment. They'll issue you in the next the next day a conditional commitment letter. When you have to get a rejection, it will take a much longer time, and it's not always easy to get a rejection, and it's not always easy to get a rejection in the way that you want them to say it. The right. banks will have like five things that they can tell you, so. Um, and they still have to go through the process of, they still have to go through the process of doing the underwriting and getting the rejection on the underwriting. And you have to be careful, for example, on sponsored deals, if you have a conditional commitment that, that conditions things on an appraisal or conditions things on, uh, on um, your employment being in place later on, you're going to have an argument on your hands or potentially an argument on your hands with with a sponsor saying, well, this is on you. This is not on us. You have to close. And then, then it, it, you know, there's a lot of money at stake. So if you can see that coming, it's kind of like the matrix, right? You know, the matrix, everything moves really slow, Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, but things are going full speed. So you need the right attorney who's going to look at something ahead of time and say, all right, change course um, and go for it. Because if you waste time, you can end up with the real problem on your hands. I could see on the co-op side, easier to get out because that, you know, if you play your cards right and you're in this situation, you've lost your job, perhaps, maybe your income has been um, kind of, it's been detached from you. When you put in the board application, you could red flag that for yourself in a certain way. And the board has, you know, the, uh, authority to, without giving any explanation, to deny somebody from an application, 
And if that application is denied, the deal is dead. So what, so on, on the purchaser side on, on that, even if you're in contract and everything's going fine, if the board doesn't approve, you're done. Um, one of the, obviously there's discriminatory issues with why is a board um, going against this application and denying it. But if it's from a purely financial point of view, if somebody doesn't have a income or they've lost an income, they're eating into their savings. That's not the, their fiduciary responsibility is to ensure that all the incoming shareholders have a, a, a leg up and not going to be in the position to default on their maintenance. So that's one way that I could see it being easier for a co-op. Oh, absolutely. And the timing matters again. So I just had someone who they had lost the job about a week or two after signing the contract. They were purchasing an apartment with their spouse and the bank came back and said, well, we can approve this loan based on this, just the spouse's income alone. But they then got, they, they did not meet the income, the debt to income ratio requirement for the board. So I went to the seller's attorney and said, this is just going to be, uh, this is going to be a loser for you too, because you're just going to get a rejection. Why don't we just end the deal now? And uh, so that you're not wasting this extra time. And right. they agreed. So the timing, yeah. the timing really matters. The question becomes later on, right? After you've been approved. So in certain instances, I would say, um, in certain instances, a buyer will be able to get their money back. A lot of times the fair thing to do is to give back a portion of maintenance and other carrying costs as a fairness. Sometimes there's a settlement with that. And then you, in exchange for them giving you back, remember if you've got, if you've got $150,000 at stake and you're going to give someone back 5,000, it's not that big of a deal. People want to preserve the bulk of their deposit. So you can work something like that out. Sometimes you can work out an extension where they'll give you a second bite at the apple and, and allow you to go to a, to another, to another lender uh, or work out some, some flexible agreement because the, at the same time, the seller doesn't want to go back to this market where we don't know where prices are at. So there's, there's some degree of flexibility. And then you know, the last part of it is you can have times where someone may have more leverage. You know, you have someone who's buying an all cash condominium and, you know, and it's a couple of million bucks and they've got a, you know, they've got, let's say a 10% deposit and they've got big pockets and they've got lawyers, they may have more leverage. And I think you're starting to see that with some of the the bigger sponsors where they're now coming back. I just saw an article in Bloomberg the other day with colleagues who were talking about having deals negotiated with sponsors where they were reducing the price or throwing in things like parking spots. I can tell you um, people who are, who buy new construction condos where there are things like parking spots or roof amenities in 2008, I remember I had a client who was in contract and the sponsor couldn't close and we had the right to get our money back. And the first thing, the very first thing they threw out was, Oh, we'll throw in a rooftop cabana. And so, um, so uh, there are ways of, of dealing with things. And if people understand the risks and they say, no, I'm in, I know what I'm getting and they have leverage and they may be able to negotiate a sweeter deal, but there are risks because you can't necessarily, you can't, unilaterally pull out of a contract. You can't just decide, once you sign a contract, you can't just decide that you want to get your money back and you're out unless you have legal grounds for doing so. Right. That's law 101. Yeah. You can't um, unilaterally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's also other loopholes. Remember, I mean, there's some buildings that take forever to approve people. So there's a provision in paragraph six of the uh, boilerplate of the standard co-op contract that if I'm, um, if the board has not made a decision by the scheduled closing date, then the closing is adjourned for another 30 business days. And if it's not, if it's not, if there's no decision at that point, then you can, then you can cancel. Now in my time, I have never seen anyone exercise that, but I think you're going to start to see, I actually had this conversation yesterday with potentially using that and we calendared the date. Uh, and I think you're going to, you're going to see more of that now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's hard for people to get the information. Well, maybe not the information, but 
if you have a lot of board members that aren't as tech savvy, they're not looking at the digital applications. Maybe they're not reviewing, maybe they don't want to touch even the physical applications, you know, for a while. Um, they've all got other things going on in their lives right now. We're all stuck in this at home pandemic syndrome, you know, life just is altered. So I, I guess as we, we talk about these things and I, I would assume that in future contracts, we may see some carve outs, maybe for this type of thing uh, in the future. You know, if I, if there's, I'm just, throw, you know, pulling out of the thin air, but could we see uh, those carve outs that say like, okay, if there's a loss of income due to some sort of a pandemic or something out of my control, then maybe that's an easier way than trying to go at the, you know, contingencies that are there now. Oh, absolutely. I, I, you're going to, you're going to see immediate response. I shouldn't say immediate. Yeah, it is. It, there are immediate responses, not just on the lawyers. You're, and you, you're going to see it on the insurance company side too. Like, let's just go back to buildings. You're going to see, you're going to see a writer that's going to come out for uh, your next uh, contractor who's going to do a construction project. And there's going to be a pandemic writer. Um, and you're, you're going to have the ability to be able to purchase your, you know, some sort of uh, as an additional endorsement to your policy um, or some sort of risk that's going to cover it, not just contractors, but any other, any business, because, uh, you know, it'll just be another way for insurance companies to make money and or not cover a claim. In terms of the legal contracts, you're already starting to see it. And so, you know, when TRID happened a couple of years ago, for the people who don't know what TRID is, um, TRID was a response to the 2008 financial crisis and a change in, in bank policies, which ended up going into effect right around 2015, which was really like seven years after the financial crisis. And one of the things that TRID said was that lenders um, need to disclose, disclose the cost to, their, to the borrower at least three days before closing. And so what initially happened was lenders, no one knew what the law was. And so it, some lenders were taking seven days or 10 days and you need to acknowledge this within that time period or there wasn't gonna be funding. So everyone started writing these trade riders and those eventually you know, willowed away. And you don't really see that much anymore. When I see it, I cross it out because everyone knows what you have to do. Um, this, I think it will continue. I think there will be some degree of con contingency that is in place because it's it's likely it, i mean certainly i think that there's a concern you hear people talking in the media about a second wave of this coming in, in october fall, or, or yeah. november so you can't con contract around everything the most important thing is to know that you've got you, you've got parties who can work things out and think proactively I can't think of every single imaginable thing that can happen. And I also don't want to write a contract that's going to do that also, because then I'm going to have a 20 page contract and no one's going to want to do business with me or my right. clients. So there's, there's going to be some sort of hybrid that will get you to a minimal place. And then you, you work it out from there. It's walking the line of practicality versus, you know, overkill. Yeah. And I think that's a problem that a lot of people find with any type of legal service, right? Whether, and certainly um, on the hire where, where, where you have big firms who where, where partners are building out north of $1,000 an hour, there's more money, there's more risk at stake. They are, uh, uh, are the, the legal documents are much more lengthy. And then when you get down to the practical nuts and bolts of let's say a, a $500,000 co-op, it's, it's a little different. Yeah. And so you have to think about everything in the totality in the totality of the circumstances and work practically. And if you're not, um, especially with, for example, like in closings right now, if you're not thinking practically, you're going to have at some point a problem because you'll be overwhelmed just because of all the rest of the logistical hurdles. So you represent a lot of co-ops and condos. Are you seeing a trend of, zoom type annual meetings or are they just saying let's postpone it until after because i've had a hybrid i mean i've had some that have said 
we'll just postpone it. And then I have others that are saying, okay, let's do uh, some sort of a Zoom annual. We'll have the accountant and the attorney call in by Zoom and give their reports and the board could you know, talk and then they can have their election somehow that way mm-hmm. through electronic means. Or what, what are your clients basically doing? Well, at, at this point, um, and remember, this is fluid, right? So we've had these conversations about, you know, your typical annual meeting season where, you know, you're going to see most, most annual meetings is when the financials for co-ops are coming out. So you see meetings that are happening in May, June, July. Yeah. And so the notices, you know, are typically going out to shareholders well in advance and the boards are thinking about, about that ahead of time. So we've been addressing these issues the last couple of weeks. Um, most of our buildings, the bigger buildings have postponed. Um, and they've all been, been okay with that. There's no, in most situations, there's no requirement as to, or, or no penalty for not having your meeting by a certain deadline. And there isn't something in the business corporation law that imposes a penalty on that either. And in light of the circumstances of where we're at, it's certainly within the, the business judgment uh, rule for, to give boards the, the discretion to say, hey, you know what? Uh, we're not going to do that right now. Uh, the question then becomes, when, when is too long? Okay. And so that's why all of this is, is very fluid. And I think that everything is changing so frequently that, that you will start to see the process evolving. If you have a, a smaller building, say, let's say like 10, you know, 10 units, to me, it, you can do a Zoom annual meeting. It's going to be much of a yeah. less of a big deal. Remember, a lot of these old co-ops, you have old shareholders. You know, you, you have people, women and men in their 80s. They look, this is what they live for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a social gathering once a year. They get to see everybody. They may get to air their grievances, but this is their thing. Right. And so, so there will be people who will feel some sort of disenfranchisement from that. And so the, the question isn't, isn't so clear. It becomes a lot more complicated once you start to think of, of every type of person who's living in a building and how they can react. Like you're never going to win anyway. There's always going to be somebody who's going to complain about, uh, who's going to complain about something. Yep. But you've got a building of 200 shareholders. Um, you can see why people would want to be able to, to, to get together in person, notwithstanding like, you know, all of a sudden novel technological questions like muting everybody on the zoom call. And then there being a legal question as to whether or not you, uh, you haven't given people the right forum because then you took away the right, right. to voice their opinion in a meeting. Yeah. And then, and then how long does it then take to do? Like yeah. it, annual meetings take long enough anyway. Some of them, you know, can go really like, you know, multiple hours yeah. and you're going to sit on them and, you know, go out, you're going to sit on a, on a call and let's say the, 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 um, um, the internet goes out, <laughs> you know, like all of a sudden, like the things that you don't think about or what things like, seems like a good idea right from the outset becomes, uh, you know, all of a sudden you, you then, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about Mr. Schwartz and 4A? Yeah. Um, so most, most of the buildings, all the build, bigger buildings that I represent, they've all postponed. The question is, is once this lasts longer and there's more of a concern from a health standpoint, whether it changes. Right now, it hasn't. All right. I think by September, before the second wave hits and things probably are going to relax a little bit, I would bet that the May annual meeting season gets very busy in September. Because that's after the summer ends. Hopefully, people are back in school. Hopefully, people are back to work. Maybe we'll be practicing uh, some sort of, you know, maybe by then we'll all still be wearing masks and keeping distance. And it's hard to have an annual meeting with 200 people while keeping a social distance. So maybe there will be uh, certain places rented out that have extra seating, like a movie theater or a theater. I have one building in... um, kind of like around the Hell's Kitchen area. And every year they do their annual meeting in a theater. So they have like the theater seating and it's not 100% capacity, but it's, even though let's say it's 150 apartments, it's close. And that 
that even in that scenario, they're kind of on top of each other. So are they going to rent out now something a lot bigger? You know, these are all the, the I guess the conversations that we're going to continue to have throughout the summer to see what really makes sense from a health standpoint and from a business standpoint. And that's not just us. I'm, I'm, every industry is going through these talks and how are they shifting things? What, you know, do we need to be, you know, this is shifting everything for us too. Most of us are working remote now. Do we really need to go into the office? I get a lot done not going in my car, you know, and traveling and sitting in traffic and I can be in front of my computer for six hours a day versus working 10 hours a day. And I still get more work done because it's more focused. You know, there's obviously a lot of things that come to play here, but I guess we'll see. All we can do is wait. Right. Right. Well, I, I mean, look, this was, this is a, a, a very productive conversation. I mean, we, you know, hit on a lot of, uh, on these are real practical issues that are yeah. coming up in commercial situations and residential situations. There are factual circumstances that get in the way of all of this um, technology getting, getting in the way of all of this. Um, and all of these, every, every transaction and every building is going to have a different set of, of rules and there's going to be a different hiccup that happens every time. And you've got to uh, know how you can, how you can navigate it. We're all just trying as best as we can. I guess that's yeah. all that we could do. Yeah. And trying to get as much hand sanitizer as possible. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, all right. So let me give your information again. So Justin Weiser, Justin at WSLawNY.com. And also you could be reached by phone at 718-263-9292. I'm going to give out my cell phone for now too. Whoa. Oh. You might get like inundated with like five phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> um, give it so out. I'll just give that out for now. Um, Hopefully there's no bot in the middle of Nigeria who's checking out this podcast. Although I do hope you have fans in Nigeria who are checking out this podcast. Just, just princes. Yes. Just a, the princes, a prince right. that's looking for, you know, for me to take their money to make more money. Okay. So yeah. I'll give my, my cell phone number for now. It's 917-821-9514. Again, 917-821-9514. Um, again, the show, uh, the NYC real estate podcast, you could email us at NYC real estate podcast at gmail.com. Make it pretty easy. NYC real estate podcast at gmail.com. You can call me at my office, 212-335-2723. I'm extension 201. Again, I'm Mark Levine, Justin Weiser. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. I think we learned a lot. I think we covered a lot of topics. I'm sure we'll see you again. Yeah. I hope so. Thanks. I, it's always it's always a pleasure coming on here. I didn't think that my daughter would show up, but what's yes, her name? Yeah. Her name is Ruby. Ruby. Well, she's very cute. I liked her yeah. haircut. Yeah. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> yeah, All I, right. I, I, I'm not in the. You know, she's got a better grooming situation than I do. Yeah. So we'll have you back. We'll talk about some other stuff next time. That sounds great, Mark. Thanks so much. You take care and stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.